Welcome to my lecture about prognostic reasoning. My name is Selma May and I'm at, uh, working at the University of Applied Science in Utrecht, the Netherlands. Before I uh, talk about prognostic reasoning, I would like to do a little exercise with you together. Um, and I want you to imagine that you're in a gr group of people, uh, you're uh, facing each other, um, and you have to talk about the hobbies uh, and the interests of each other. You have just tried to get to know the other. What would you ask? If it would be me, I probably would tell you about me. Um, I'm 45. I'm a mother of three children. You can see them. I'm a passionate lecturer at the University of Applied Science. That's the picture in the middle. And I love to go camping. And I'm always looking for a campsite where I can uh, lit a fire because I love to have, sit at the fire with my friends, talking, having a glass of wine. But I'm also uh, still an active uh, athlete at track and fields. And uh, you can see a picture of me um, during the finals uh, last year where I was uh, second with my team. We didn't win because of me, because I'm still young, but because of the woman standing next to me, who was uh, older than 70 years old and still an active ath athlete. So when you just think about uh, um, the question to get to know each other, you ask things like, um, what do you like? What do you want to know? What, uh, what are you interested in? When are you lucky? When are you sad? Things like that. But um, I could tell you another story. And that's probably what's happened if I would come to you on a referral of, um, of, a, uh, um, of a doctor. I could tell you about my back pain. I have back pain since I'm young. Um, I'm still having back pain almost every day. Um, and probably your questions would be different. It would be more about my pain um, it was more about the provocation of pain. Um, it was more about testing your hypothesis about my pain. And your question probably wouldn't be uh, more uh, about me as a person and what I want in my life. So why is this um, the, the starting example when, I've got a, when I talk about prognostic reasoning? Because I think it's always important to think about where our, of, uh, our questions depends on. And that's very important when we talk about prognostic reasoning, I think. It's my own opinion. And um, um, when, where the, our the questions depends on is our perspective on the story of our patient. I have, we are more biomedical perspective or my more a bio so psychosocial uh, perspective. Um, and that depends on the way we ask uh, and what we want to know from our patients. Um, that's one thing I think our question depends on. And the other thing I think it depends on our way we communicate with each other. Um, and it depends on the way we ask our questions and we know uh, patient-centered and therapeutic-centered communication and patient-centered is about just asking the patient and not just testing what we think um, and um, if you want to know more about the questions of uh, the perspectives and where we i think our communication depends on i would advise you to read um, the, the the article from Bensing about bridging the gap between patient and uh, caregiver. So when I think about prognostic reasoning, um, for me, it's really getting to know the other, uh, trying to understand uh, the ability of the other. And I would like to talk about uh, the example of the uh, uh, Dutch uh, guidelines for low back pain and the change of perspective uh, and understanding um, uh, that we can see in the guidelines uh, so that we have to change our thinking about patients when we talk about prognostics. Um, when we look at the old um, guidelines, uh, it was um, uh, 
we could find three patient profiles in it. Um, the profile one was a patient with a normal recovery. Uh, um, the second one was a uh, patient with abnormal recovery uh, without dominant psychosocial factors. And the last one was about those with dominant so psychosocial uh, factors. And I see a mistake here. Um, and when I discussed it with the students, it was more like, okay, you, you see a patient and after some time you think, oh, the recovery is not normal. So what's happening? Um, so I think that's like looking retrospective instead of looking forward. So I think this is not the real questions we should ask. Um, so they changed the uh, she changed it, and they said this is not the correct way to look at your patient to think about normal and abnormal recovery uh, during the timeline. And they changed it to uh, treatment profiles um, where you start at moment one to think about the ability um, of your patient to recover. Uh, and they look more like, well, is my patient on risk to not recover uh, of normal um, uh, manner? Uh, so profile one is a low risk uh, for long-term complaints because we know a lot of um, acute low back pain patients are just self-limiting uh, and they can just recover in a normal uh, way. Um, and there are no dominant prognostic factors for a delayed recovery. Thus, the potential of your patient to recover normally is high. Um, so I think that's a good way to look at the patient because when you think, hey, this one could recovery just because the ability is very strong to recover on a normal, healthy way, then we probably do, should change our treatment uh, with those patients because we can use this ability to recover uh, to, um, to support the patient in the recovering process. But when you look at profile two or three, then it's about your um, your uh, idea that the, the patients are minor risk or high risk for developing long-term complaints or have no um, uh, uh, or less ability to cope with the situation. And that means that you should do different things when you think that probably somebody is on risk not to the, the, to the recovery on the normal way. Um, so this new guidelines uh, um, tells us that we really should try to understand our patient and the patient's ability uh, for recovery. And then we talk about, when we talk about the ability, we, we talk about prognosis. Why do we think the one patient recover normally and the other not? And when we look at the uh, way of risk factors, prognostic factors, or however you will call it, you can just order this in different manners. Um, and this is one actually using the biopsocial, uh, psychosocial model to just label factors, things you hear about your patient um, in uh, the traditional way of uh, looking at risk factors. Um, here you can see biomedically a lack of sleep, lifestyle, mouth genetics uh, can be uh, a prognostic factor to recover normally or not. Um, social, we know that social uh, support um, can be a risk if there's no a lack of social uh, support to recover or not. Financial problems could be a risk factor. Psychological self-efficacy attachment uh, and stress are risk factors for uh, less ability to recover. But when we look at the new definition of health from Huber 2012, I think recovery is more than just thinking about what of the, 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 the ordering of risk factors more than just putting it in a box of biome biomedical, social or psychological. 
I think we have to think about um, more the impact of the risk factor of, of, of the risk factor in the in the of the timeline. Um, so it's about your ability to adapt uh, and take control in the case of uh, challenges in life. So we have to more a dynamic uh, look at risk factors, I think. And when you look at the literature, you see um, this ordering. Uh, it's about predisposition, provoking factors and maintaining factors. Um, uh, predisposition is something that's in the person. Uh, uh, when you look at uh, your genetic, that's it's 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 something that could be uh, could be there that you're more on risk. You know, by f for example, that depression. There's a by so at some patients there's a little change in the genetic in the DNA that you're more on risk uh, for developing a depression. But that doesn't mean that you always will get a depression, and that most of the time de depends on provoking and maintaining factors. So predisposition is something that's in your your personality, that's it's that's in you as a patient and in a person, um, and that's something we most of the time can't change as a physical therapist because we just have to deal with this. And when the predisposition is very high, and sometimes we need other disciplines that can uh, work with those these factors. And that's probably the same about the provoking factors. Provoking factors means there was, in the timeline of your patient, there was an event that provoked the problems the patient had th at this point. Uh, but it was in the past, and when it's in the past, we can't change it, actually. Um, so, probably provoking factors is something we have to realize that's part of the problem of our patients. But sometimes we can't change it, because we, all, most of the time, um, uh, we work with the result of the provoking factor, of the impact of it on the daily life of Iman. Of the, somebody, and then it's more like an in maintaining uh, factor. And if the provoking factor is very dominant in in the problem, probably you, then you just use different uh, of the. Then there are different disciplines. For example, when you treat somebody with uh, post-traumatic stress problems, um, sometimes they just have to do something with this provoking factor from of the of the trauma we are not trained to do something with this and then but we can see that the provoking factor is still an issue in somebody's life then they first have to go to treat those provoking factors and that's there are a lot of other dif disciplines who are more trained and re of they're more they are trained in treating that that we are not so when we talk about prognostic reasoning, we have to realize there are predispositions, there are provoking factors. But when we have to take it into account during our uh, treatment plans, then most of the time we think about the maintaining factors and that are the factors that they are still um, in somebody's life um, uh, so that they are not a able to um, to uh, um, take to adapt or take uh, the lead during the recovery process. And when we talk about the maintaining factors, um, uh, you can see our list here. Uh, we talk about physical maintaining factors, emotional maintaining factors, cognitive maintaining factors, behavioral maintaining factors, social, and there's a group of maintaining factors, probably sometimes because they are Part of it is in the uh, predisposition and uh, uh, provoking uh, part uh, that are con contraindication for physical therapy. So what I want to do is I will go through those factors and talk about things you probably should take uh, uh, into account uh, during your uh, patient interview that you should ask about because sometimes those maintaining factors are part of the problem. Um, and why somebody not can uh, is not able to recover normally. 
When we look at f physical maintaining factors, here are some examples. Uh, during the last years, I think the sleep and the quality of sleep is getting more and more um, uh, attention. We know that a lot of pa patients with chronic pain have sleeping uh, problems, um, more than 50 percent. And sleeping problems is um, uh, a big thing. It's a, it could be that I'm not able to get to sleep. Um, sometimes it's the problem is that I can't sleep uh, when I'm asleep, that I awake a lot and stay awake during night. But a lot of people experience uh, good sleep and not getting uh, up fit. So they are still tired during the day or fatigue how we would call it. So sleep is quite a thing you should ask about the quality of sleep and the effect of sleep and recovery during night uh, on somebody's well, uh, feeling well. Yeah. Now we know that a bad physical condition is a physical maintaining factor. When I'm not fit, I experience more uh, symptoms. Eating pattern, um, is a physical maintaining factor. Sometimes we hear that uh, fit vitamin D, for example, uh, can ease a little bit of the pain uh, intensity uh, when they, people start uh, to take vitamin D. Um, and another uh, physical maintaining factor is that uh, sometimes people are highly sensitive to physical symptoms and sensation. They feel a lot. Uh, um, and you can say that's more like it's not only a physical maintaining factor, um, but it could be an, 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 another one as well. But um, some people feel a lot in their life, in their body. When we look at emotional maintaining factors um, and we ask about this, our patient, sometimes they talk about on our higher, they say, say I'm angry. Uh, but sometimes you have to check why are you angry to ch check what, what's uh, the motivation of talking about a certain emotion um, and it's not only the emotion but uh, the interpretation of the emotion for somebody and i think a lot of people are frustrated um, about their complaints because they can't have control on it they they live with it they are the pain sometimes uh, sometimes they people feel ashamed uh, um, and they feel that they are failing um, and people are, are not easy in uh, interpreting uh, interpreting the feelings of and physical condition um, so they are sometimes a little bit confused about everything and um, when I talk about this with my students, I always bring the example of uh, the young woman in the small uh, uh, paper here. She's suffering from a more um, extreme psychosomatic problems, uh, more um, disorder. Uh, but she taught, she had a, a conversion, uh, and she had the uh, she couldn't walk and she won several medals at the Olympic, uh, Paralympic Games. And then the, she could walk again. And uh, she was had to talk uh, on the Dutch television about the, her recovery, how you would call it. I, I'm not sure if I would call it recovery, but she could walk again. And she had to deal with a lot of people saying, you, uh, uh, you betrayed us because you could walk and you can walk again and you didn't do it. And when I looked at the interview with her, I could see shame because sometimes you don't, you can't explain what you feel, but you feel it. And a lot of uh, uh, people um, suffer because they can't explain it. And probably when you look at, if you think back to uh, some of your patients, um, say they said something like, you can't see it on the outside, but I can feel it. I had a lot of patients who said that. And I mean, that's an example about 
the, the, the struggle they have emotionally. A strong, I think one of the strongest uh, maintaining factors, uh, probably all of them are strong, but what we, we think about when we talk to our patients are the cognitive uh, maintaining factors. We know a lot of patients who have somatic fixation and that's our patients, when you would think about them, uh, do they have a biomedical um, perspective on their complaints or biopsychosocial, you would say uh, the patient has a biomedical uh, perspective on his own complaints. So that, that the patients who can tell you when you ask them, when do you feel pain, then they can tell you everything taught in a detail that you think, okay, <laughs> that's a lot of information. So somatic fixation is something that a lot of people have and just thinking about everything. Yeah? Okay, when I do this, I feel that. And I, when I do that, I can feel that. And then when I go there, then it feels like that. There are so many details. We know that people struggle or accept them, their complaints. And that's a, a strange concept because I understand when you feel pain that you can't accept it. But when you have a long term of pain, pain is so part of your life. That we, and we know that we sometimes say, my patient is the pain. That losing the pain could be very shocking as well. Yeah? So acceptance, seeing the, the pro and the contrast is part of uh, um, the, the cognitive maintaining factors. When I just look at what's against the pain and I can't see that sometimes there are pros for pain, then I struggle and fight against the pain. Um, somatic fixation and preoccupation of complaints is a little bit the same, uh, um, but sometimes the way you present a patient is different. Um, we know a lot of people with pain, of uh, persistent pain, uh, have fear of a disease, of illness, uh, thinking about there should be something really bad uh, that explains why I feel like I feel. So they're still looking for something and they are re really afraid that there is something going on that explains it, but they don't want to know it. Um, feeling of no influence, lack of control. That's what people often tells us when we ask about it. Um, they are controlled by the pain, but they have no control on their recovery. Uh, they say, I don't know what I should do to change it. Um, and we see people fear of movement. And sometimes we are part of the fear of movement because we tell them what they should do. And sometimes they've experienced no success. So they experience that movement isn't always uh, functional. Um, and we, are we, as a the therapist, often talk about movement as uh, as there's a lot of we can do, but I think we should respect some, sometimes the patient's movement experience and understand that sometimes what we talk is what we tell them that's not good to move like that. It could be an adaptation that's very functional for the patient, but we still know that fear of movement um, and avoidance because of the fear is an uh, is a maintaining factor and that's a little bit more like behavioral but fear of movement is very important to talk about um and the last one is here is about worrying doom monitoring people think a lot what's going on they think about what's happened what's going to be in the past and those Worrying all the time can lead to more stress and less ability to adapt uh, uh, to the situation. The next one is, I would like to talk about behavior. And sometimes behavior is the result of emotions. It's about uh, of cognitions. Um, so when we look at behavior, we can see b certain behavior patterns at our patients. Uh, we can see people who overuse um, and that are people who go shopping, we call it. 
Yeah? They go to one caregiver, one doctor, next caregiver, and they've seen a lot of patients, uh, patient, uh, caregivers, excuse me. Uh, so they are overusing of care, just looking for the one who's going to save them. Um, and when we don't think about that and we just think, okay, I'm the next one and I will save you, probably we will just go on and do, it will happen the same. But sometimes they have seen so many people, it's, it's surprising. So overuse of care is really a behavior we can see a lot with patients with pay, uh, persistent pain. And we should take attention to it. But sometimes, and that's not about their timeline, but more about the daily life, we see people who avoid, uh, and that can be avoiding uh, or doing nothing, that's the under, we call it the underuser. But sometimes they avoid to feel the consequences of it because, uh, by softening it, and then it's more the addiction, and that's about drugs, alcohol, uh, taking pain, uh, killing uh, medicine all the time. Um, that's the one group, but another group we can see is all or nothing behavior, still fighting and doing as if they don't feel anything. Um, and they can't manage what, what feels good and what not. Can I say no or not? They are just going on, going on, going on, and then they drop uh, because then it's too much. So we call that the overusers. Um, People who have high expectations on you themselves are on uh, risk uh, because uh, I have to show that I can do it. Uh, uh, so it's more like you you have to level this a little bit. Um, and the people who have difficulties to ask for help are a group where you can see uh, behavior and maintaining factors that are the people who still do all the house uh, work working uh, household um, they are still uh, doing the dishes they're doing the uh, washing everything because they don't want to be a burden to another one um, and when you were when you are like that it's very difficult to stop and think okay what i need what is important to me so people, these are behavioral f factors. I think we all recognize uh, those patients in the, uh, during our encounter with them. Social maintaining factors. There is more factors uh, in the interaction with, with uh, uh, different peoples. And sometimes we see dysfunctional interaction with others. Um, Sometimes we see that the daughter more behaves like the parent or the son more behaves like the parent uh, when the parent is the one with persistent pain. So sometimes those whole systems have changed in the normal role uh, so as expected. Um, and when there's a system changing and in, on, a, on a somehow dysfunctional manner it's still working, then it, 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 it's maintaining that ability to adapt because why should I change it directly? Because the system has built up a stability as part of, 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 of the problem. And when the patient changes, the system has to change as well. And then it's quite complicated sometimes uh, because when you're used to that your mother's lying on the bed, because she's tired and having a lot of pain and in a sudden she's standing next to you in the kitchen and wants to help. That's quite confusing for the system as well. So when you look at dysfunctional interaction with the others, you just have to be very careful to uh, talk about it. And um, sometimes you have to just to, to respect it sometimes, but it depends on the impact on the ability to adapt. Um, I've already talked about that um, and the way we uh, talk to the patient could be a maintaining factor. And we know from literature that the disturbed relationship with, with doctors and paramedical disciplines is sometimes one of the maintaining factors. Because patients have seen so many caregivers that they sometimes don't know 
uh, who to trust and everybody with the best intentions wants to help the patient and be there for the patient but sometimes you're just the 23rd one in row uh, and then it's very important to be aware of this and to talk about this with your patient. So what are your experience with caregivers? Do you trust them or not trust them? And what, what do you think that I can do with, to help you? Uh, what are your expectations um, you have because of your experience with a lot of other caregivers? So we have to be aware that the, the experience with caregivers is one of the uh, strong social remaining uh, maintaining factors. Um, people have, that's more uh, on the side of the patient, have difficulties in the, um, of, of, with their own role uh, in society. Um, sometimes you have to give up your working life, for example, and that's sometimes a very strong definition of who I am. Uh, uh, my part of, of here is my working life, and when this d disappears, than what I have to offer to the society. Uh, and that's where patients struggles about uh, their own role, their uh, part of it, how, how can, yeah, why, why are there, yeah, the why? And, and we have to, res to talk about them because sometimes when we know the struggle, we can help them to think about goals, a uh, new definition about their own role and acceptance in that. Um, and I've already talked about that, uh, that patients sometimes tell us that on the outside you can't see my pain. Um, and indirectly they talk about the lack of recognition of their complaints. Because it's easier when you've broken your arm, then everybody can see it. And it's easy to explain that you can't function the normal way. But when you can't see it on the outside, um, then people have more difficult to um, show recognition of their complaints. And so we, um, the reaction of the, 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 the other people can be very uh, hurtful um, because they just tell you, yeah, I can see it. Uh, why, why do you have to go home early? Uh, you're still young, uh, things like that. Um, and that could be a maintaining factor in, uh, in the behavior because you don't want those reactions uh, of in your own environment. So, and there's the group of other. And um, sometimes when we talk uh, to patients with persistent chronic pain, they have more than a just chronic pain. They have complex multimorbidity on the psychiatric and somatic comorbidity. And then working with them on your own as a physical therapy is not enough. Then you need other disciplines. I've already talked about trauma and history as a provoking factor, but when the trauma is, the, is because of the impact and maintaining factor, then you need other disciplines. Uh, when the attachment problems, attachment is about how you attach to your parents and the most important people in your early years um, after birth, um, when the attachment problems are just undermining your ability to cope with stressful situations, then sometimes you just need other disciplines to help people in the strategies to cope with those things. Um, and those factors should not be treated by one discipline, but always be treated in interprofessional treatment systems. Um, so they're not part of the physical therapist treatment, but they should be recognized uh, and the importance of an interprofessional treatment should be uh, recognized as well. This was just a list with a lot of terms, but how can we put that in our daily practice and what should we learn the students about it? Um, and then we talk about diagnostics. 
Um, actually, we should screen our patient all dimension of the ICF, not only the functional or what health everything. We should always try to get a broad story of our patients. We have to analyze our story uh, of our patients. That's clinical reasoning, not only on the biomedical way, but just biopsychosocial. Um, we, and why should we do that? Because we always have three options after our uh, diagnostic process, and that's an indication to treat as a physical therapist. So am I the right personal professional to treat the patient? Uh, but sometimes it's wait and see. When you look at uh, about the guidelines, low back pain, and you expect there's a low risk, sometimes you can choose wait and see. Uh, nature is strong, um, and the patient has the ability to adapt. And some we have to refer um, our patient to another uh, profession, because sometimes other professions are more important. Um, and how can we train ourselves not to forget those those factors at all and this is a way we can train ourselves uh, during our um, interview with the patient and it is uh, called the pcs cebm model model um, um, where you just go along uh, you follow this the structure to um, um, to check if there's one factor of other prognostic factors that could be uh, important to think about. Um, I won't go into pain, um, but uh, because there are a lot of articles about pain, which you can ask about it. So when you focus on the somatic part of the story of your patient, you talk about the history. Uh, it's a mapping about uh, of all physical and mental problems of your patient. You ask about sleep pattern and eating pattern so that you can get an, an, uh, an idea about um, um, what's relevant for you. Cognition, when we talk about it, it's probably um, the, the, the model of uh, self-regulation uh, where we think about um, and Leventhal, uh, uh, who introduced this model, said uh, actually when we want to uh, ask about cognition, it's always five five things, five questions we should ask our patient. Um, and here you can see, and it's about what do I have to the identity of the cause, um, what caused it, uh, the timeline, how long will it last. Uh, consequences and uh, can I control it? That these are five important uh, questions we should ask our patients. Um, there's one uh, questionnaire, it's the EPQK, um, whose a, a, a way we could use it uh, more structured, if not more narrative. So when you uh, just want to um, use a test, you can just use this questionnaire. So those five questions can help us to uh, uh, check on the cognitions of our patients. And when we talk about uh, emotions, um, we just, these are the basic emotions, but as I said, it's not only the emotion that is more visible, but sometimes we have to check what's beneath this. Um, to understand the emotion and the impact of the emotions on somebody uh, coping. Huh? Um, and when you look at the uh, emotions, uh, anxiety and depression, you can discuss if it's an emotion or not. Uh, you can ask about uh, specific, specific things like, are you feeling uh, sweating? Um, uh, pressure on your breast, dry mouth, numbness, um, avoiding things, people, um, amo av avoiding movements, um, and just to get more grip on um, fear, anxiety, 
um, and we can use the, the Tampa scale of kinesphobia or of the fear avoidance scales to check more on the fear of movement, uh, um, to check that uh, systematically during your uh, patient interviewing. Depression, uh, and uh, when we check on depression, uh, numbness of how we would call this, um, we can check using the Goldberg questions about loss of energy, loss of interest, loss of trust in yourself and loss of hope. Um, in the Netherlands, there's a screening tool, the 4DSQ, who, who is developed for um, uh, general doctors um, to screen whether somebody is on risk for the, the depression. Because we see that a lot of pain patients always suffer from symptoms of depression. And when they have a high score on depression, then there probably is a more uh, high risk for depression, then, then you should refer all your patient probably. Uh, so these are two examples uh, what you can use to be more, um, um, just not ask about uh, emotions, but labeling when the, the emotions are really getting dysfunctional for somebody. When you talk about behavior, you should ask the patients about uh, behavior, healthy behavior and unhealthy behavior. Uh, you should talk about avoidance and uh, um, if there is somebody, some behavior things are more persistent in somebody's life. Um, just check it, uh, talk about it um, and check whether it's more an ability or more an, uh, um, a disability for somebody in the adaptation to the problems. When we ask about during the structured manner of interviewing the patient, the social thing, you can ask about the, uh, the housing or living situation, uh, the environment of somebody um, work but you should all, always talk, uh, you should talk about relationships with the partner, uh, with people at the work, other health conditions, so uh, caregivers, so that you can get an experience how the social interaction uh, with others is, uh, if whether there's an impact on somebody's ability to adapt. And yeah, the, I'm talking about the negative ability. Uh, of the ne negative impact on the ability, but sometimes we can find surprisingly positive impact on the ability and then we should use it during our encounter with the patient. Uh, the last one in the this model of interviewing p patients about motivation. Um, and motivation is a, is a hot topic, I think, because motivation depends on different factors. Um, but um, and during our program, we use that model, what you can uh, see on the right side, it's called the IC model. Um, and motivational uh, uh, is something we, we should think about as a physical therapist, uh, because movement and working with somebody to change his movement is, is a behavioral change. And to change your behavior, you think it depends on your motivation. And the AAC model is about the, the impact of your attitude, your social influence and your self-efficacy uh, on the intention to uh, change your behavior. Um, but it's not only looking at the intention, but are you able, do you have knowledge uh, uh, and skills to change? And what are your barriers and support to the ability and the disabilities to uh, be able to change? Um, and this complex interaction depend, uh, makes if I'm high motivated or lower motivated to change and be able to change actually. And I think we should talk, we, of, I don't think we, we could talk about motivation longer than I'm doing now because behavioral change is a very uh, important topic in uh, uh, guiding our patients. but. For now, I think it's enough to say, think about motivation, ask about it, ask about the factors that are um, influencing the motivation of our patient in relationship to the behavioral goals of goals of the patients. And you can be surprised what you hear sometimes uh, when you ask people 
um, about the motivation. This is a model we use uh, to train our students in interviewing patients. If you are a physical therapist, you, uh, you could use it as well um, um, to uh, train yourself, not to just ask of a pain in somatic, but ask more about the other factors um, that I've talked about in the first part of my uh, short lecture. Um, and I hope that you will think about using it, train yourself and uh, develop your skills to uh, look uh, not only for what's going on at this moment with the patient, but um, get to know your patient and his values just uh, yeah, to get to you know your patient and the person uh, who's having the pain and not only the pain. Thank you for listening. And I hope uh, we will meet uh, one time, if you want, and then we can discuss this uh, further. Thank you.